welcome to A Moment of Bach, where we take our favorite moments from the composer's vast musical output, just a minute's worth or even a few seconds, and show you why we think they are remarkable. We are your hosts, Christian and Alex Giebert. This is part two of two in our little mini-series here on the glorious section of the Mass in B minor. Last week we looked at the Gloria movement. This time, what immediately follows, et in terra pax. <laughs> Let's hear the end of that Gloria movement again. It's the one we talked about last week. And let's hear how it segues into the Et in Terra Pax movement, or And on Earth Peace, Goodwill Toward Men. So did you notice how the choir started singing it in terra pox, and then they stop, then you hear some instruments for a while. What happens is the choir sings at once, and then the violins and violas kind of echo that a little bit, and then you've got the woodwinds, and that's flutes and oboes, then they echo it. And then as they continue to kind of ascend, these notes just keep going up and up, then the voices come back in. pretty remarkable thing here that you mentioned, Christian, when we were just looking at this before we started recording, is this moment where the bass sings pox and tenor sings pox like this. It's kind of cool. The note just stays. You know, it's called pedal point. We've talked about this before, but really rare case of double pedal point here. Tenor's on a different note. It's a fifth above and the other stuff is going on above it. It's just not very common. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen this anywhere else. Music theory people out there, teachers and stuff, can we call this double pedal point? I think that's probably what I'd call it. Very unusual, and it's wonderful, because normally a pedal point is one note, and it sits there for a long time, maybe a low note, sometimes not a low note, but often a bottom note, just like this one starts. Right, Alex, the first thing that happens is the choir sings et in terra pox, and you said that after that, the strings come in and then the winds come in, right? But underneath all of that, when the strings come in, is that nice low note by the bass instruments that just sort of peacefully, let's say, uh, just sits there. Yeah. And doesn't move. This is not as active. This is a contrast because it's on earth peace. So it peacefully sits there. But then the tenors come in after that, the choir comes back in. And then we have this pedal point that's kind of this open fifth interval, but they hold for a few beats, long enough for it to really matter. And I don't, I don't know if I can think of another time that something like that happens, a double pedal point. No, it's, it's the only time anything sounds like that in this whole work, and maybe in anything I've heard of Bach, it's just it's that unusual. But... It is not my moment. <laughs> I was going to say, just, it. Yeah. also it produces a wonderfully silly-looking figure uh, on the figured bass in this full score I have, edition oh. I have here at the downbeat of measure five. You've got a bottom note, and then the intervals it says to play above it from the bottom up in order is five, two, four, natural, seven. So, oh yeah, yep. In other words, this yeah. is a five-note chord, which is very unusual. The, yeah, it's, it's a way of writing that that figured base it's a way of writing that figure they just had to do it because they had to write it they're like okay i guess we got to figure out how to write this right yeah or do you think bach would have written that i don't actually know if bach would have written these numbers out because you can extrapolate that from what's happening in the yeah. rest of the score i think they were added by editors later yeah but people did read music that way if they played those um 
continuo instruments like the organ in this case or maybe a harpsichord but you never see any you rarely see something that complicated with four numbers there and it's really yeah, fun that's a good point and it's because of that weird double pedal point then another moment that i love happens right after that listen to that bass move up after the pedal point is done the bass is starting to move up and it has this like lumbering effect almost it sounds like this You'll recognize that as the same melody that we heard the higher instruments and higher voices just sing and play, but in this one, it's kind of it kind of lumbers, and it also what's cool about it is that it at the end of it it has that D natural. which contrasts with, or clashes almost, but doesn't quite clash, with the soprano voice, soprano one voice that's singing over it. It's like... So that D natural and the... is in the D sharp up here in the soprano. It's an example of a cross relation. Yeah. You know when you play those together... They do sound horrible, <laughs> but the way that they work in this context, it totally works in the context of the whole thing. The soprano note is higher and it leads up. The bass note is lower, so it falls down and it all works the way it's supposed to. And you said lumbering as a way to describe. I love when Bach chooses to do this. Instead of just having the notes presented straight on the beat, he when he uses et intera pax as a text setting, often when the singers begin, you'll get to this later with the fugue subject also, but even here before it, they come in syncopated. They come in off the beat. And then when they do lumber along, they, they sort of slide along. So it's not et intera pax or anything like that. That's a little bit too martial and forceful. It's really more slippery than that. It's Et intera pax, and each one is sort of pushed into the next one. Yeah, it just it's such a great like rhythmic vitality to it. Whenever you syncopate anything, and it just makes it seem so much fresher. The last movement of the first half of the Saint Matthew Passion has this in spades. It's like the whole instrumental part is ma- built on it. It's like uh, it's the O Mensch Bivine, right? <laughs> That it's got that and it, it's just he could have just went da 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 but instead he went da 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 and there's a little like anticipation on each one each yeah every it, single one has an anticipatory note before it because yeah. every single note on the beat is preceded by itself in in a way that's yeah way it gives it. it like this like not just a lilting quality, but like an excited quality because it sounds like it's getting ahead of itself, you know? Yeah, it's just a beautiful way to to ornament a melody, really. Yeah. So th- what we don't know yet by listening to just the first part of this piece is this first little, this first little melodic fragment is going to act as the subject of a fugue later. And really not that much later. It's really just in like 30 seconds from now. So let's hear a little bit of that we just heard, right? It sounds like this. And then we get a little bit of the rest of the text here to close us off as a cad- in a cadence here. The part that says, Hominibus bone voluntatis, which is goodwill toward men. Oh, there's another pedal point in the bass now. Well, the instruments are just kind of floating up and up and up, aren't they? And here comes a bass lumbering down thing that I love. Here we go. So I love that little cadence there. You heard a cadence, and it landed on a minor chord. But then, here's what happens right after that. A voice enters.
So that's a familiar melody. That's the melody we already heard. But this time it's going to be the subject of a fugue. Now listen again to that same entrance. That was a soprano one. They're going to sing that again at intera pax. But then when they get to the end of hominibus bone voluntatis, they will then start singing bone voluntatis again. But on the word volunta, they take a long time on this sort of melismatic phrase, which means it's like a bunch of notes running up and down on the same syllable. So listen for the soprano one to do that. Now, if you were listening to that, you probably noticed that another voice entered during it. The alto voice entered with our second subject now, right? And you can call this an answer, right, mm -hmm. Christian? Yeah, so this is a little bit of Fugue 101 here. Yeah. The main theme, you could call it, the thing that happens first and isolated by the first voice that comes in is the subject of our fugue. And then a second part comes in as an answer and does the subject again, but in a different key. Yep. And probably a little teeny bit different notes altered a little, but it's going to be recognizable. Yep. And then what does that first part do when the second part comes in? It needs to do something else. It doesn't just stop. And so it usually does a really busybody type of flowery fast notes there and we often call this the counter subject yep and this is like you say if you go on a one because it's a great just ur example almost of a fugue like it's a textbook fugue in the sense that the subject is a recognizable tune in fact bach like we said already presented that tune to us a little bit earlier in the piece in half of it yeah yeah and then when the counter subject comes in like well i shouldn't say comes in it just flows out of the subject right when it flows out of the subject it's just all this fast this fast little running notes and it becomes background to the next you know the answer that comes in with the the subject again in different key it's just it's just gorgeous and when it's in these two parts alone soprano one and then alto at that entrance it it's so like beautiful just with those two voices and that's not even talking about the cool stuff that's happening under it, which is as soon as that alto enters, it's this texture gets changed a little bit and he's got the orchestra doing these short notes on the beat. And it's just, it's so cute. I just love yeah, it. <laughs> a little accompaniment. Yeah. But the, the way that the counter subject just goes off with a bang and just starts singing all these really fast 16th notes. That's basically why it's called a fugue. In general, fugues do this, especially when the counter subject starts to take off. Yeah. They start to sort of run away. And that is what fugue means. It running or flying, flying away. Yeah, like you say, taking off. They, a lot of these lines sound like the, like liftoff kind of line. They sound very flighty. Yeah. And again, with these short notes in the accompaniment, that's just another little bit of genius of Bach where he's he's letting you hear the stuff in the counter subject more clearly by making the accompaniment like soft and short in the background. So then Fugue 101, what happens next? After two voices are in, a third voice will come in, right? The third voice is going to have the subject. This time it'll be in that same key as the first voice had it. It'll be the tenor voices entering with the subject. When the tenor voices enter, the second voice, which was the alto, is now ready to do the counter subject. So you'll hear in this tenor entrance, when they come in, you'll hear the alto voice starting to do that. Now then, what does the first voice do? The soprano ones, they're still going. And the soprano one is going to just like do extra stuff now. It just it fills in more things. There's an, a whole other independent melody happening on the soprano yeah, so one. So now there's now there's three things going on. Yeah, and that's in the voices alone. I mean, technically there's also a bass line and an accompaniment, but just in in the terms of like what are the melodic fugue voices that are happening? There's three now. There's the tenor singing the subject. The alto is on the counter subject. 
The Soprano is now doing a third thing, and there's different uh, ways to analyze what you might call that, or if it's just freely composed, but it's independent. Yeah. So if you can listen to this and listen to each voice come in, when you hear a voice, a new voice come in, it means the previous voice that came in is about to do its, or has actually already started, its little counter subject. That's the fluttery fast notes. We're going to start this fugue over, and I'm going to just call out entrances that are about to happen just to keep your ear primed for them, but otherwise I'll shut up, and then you can just listen. And there are five, right? So the last one is going to be the Soprano two entrance. And after that, I'll just let the rest of the next few measures play out until it gets to a little cadence. Then you'll hear a break from the voices all at the same time suddenly that this part of the fugue will be over. So let's hear that, starting at that first entrance with the soprano one. Okay, here comes alto. And the tenor. Okay, here comes the bass voice. This one's harder to hear. Here comes the soprano two, kind of in the middle. So if you couldn't hear the soprano too, that's pretty understandable because it's in the middle of the texture. It doesn't really stick out. But if you did hear it, you probably recognized that recognizable melody just kind of buried in the texture there, but it does pop out if you're listening for it and you've got the melody sort of in your brain already. That's the best way to listen for it. Yeah, but it is transposed. It is in a different key. That's true. And actually, the, yeah, the soprano two one is different than all the other ones in terms of key. It's a five voice fugue here. And he gets to start bending the rules a little bit. It's so lovely that there are five voice parts in this and much of the mass in B minor. It's so great. Most, you know, most choral music is in four parts. And that's true of a lot of the music from this time period and a lot after. And anything modern, the default might be four. And it's so nice that there's five and you get another layer of complexity and stuff like this where he gets to really show his chops at counterpoint. Because it's not a everyday thing to write a five voice fugue right okay so then there's a second fugue here and i love how he gets into it he gets into it by actually having all the voices just kind of like seeing 18 terror pox again and then stop okay so no fugue yet and then they're gonna do it again Oh, and they stopped. Okay, but now this time they're going to do it again, and they're going to sing. They're all going to sing 18 terapox, hominibus, bone voluntatis, boom, land on a cadence. And you might just think, okay, all the voices are just singing there. There's no fugue. But sneakily, he makes the soprano one be the melody here. It actually is a subject that's going to kick off a fugue. Right after that little cadence, he then has the soprano one do the counter subject. And all of a sudden, the soprano one's singing those fast fluttery notes. And immediately the alto comes in with the second subject, also known as the answer. And it's just another fugue, but he just he, he cloaks it. He just he's sneaky he's sneaky about it. So let's hear that. I'm gonna start it there where the, all the voices enter together, but really the soprano that's doing the melody is the beginning of a fugue, is the subject. So if you're gonna listen for something, keep your ear on that highest melody. <laughs> And there they go, and now the alto is doing the subject. So just to be clear here, we're talking about fugues. Sometimes just issue of terminology, a fugue could be an entire musical work with multiple sections like this in it. 
So you could call this whole movement from when that first fugal section begins, the fugue. What, what really matters to us is like when everything resets. Like you said, Alex, Bach did a really clever thing where soprano has the melody, or let's say the subject, but there's a lot happening when the soprano one has it. Yeah. And then they all cut out, the voices cut out except for the alto comes in, and then you can tell he alighted it very cleverly. Those are like fugue expositions, or different sections of a fugue. If you're thinking of something like a Bach keyboard fugue or something from the well-tempered clavier, those fugues are a little bit more compact. They have an opening section that's just this exposed stuff very out in the open, and we call those the exposition. And then as it, as it gets going, you can add more academic terminology to it, but that's not really the point. The point is how cleverly he weaves it all together. And what about all the other instruments during this? We've just been talking about voices for the last few minutes. Well, it, typically he will do what's called doubling, which means like have the violas play along with the alto singers for uh, for quite a bit of time or for however long he feels like he needs to, typically during like the fugue subject or whatever. And that's happening all throughout this part to kind of reinforce the singers. Sometimes they're singing on their own, but other times they do get reinforced by the instruments. And then the instruments get to shine on their own later when the singers finally get to their their conclusion of this part of the fugue. Here's how that sounds. You'll hear the cadence happen. The singers will stop. Then you'll hear one measure of the trumpets getting a little feature. Then one measure of the flutes and oboes getting a little like response to the trumpets, a nice little feature for the for those woodwinds. Then the choir comes back. So here's trumpets, then woodwinds. So that's one thing about Bach is that he's, it's never boring because there's always something else going on. He's never done that little thing with the trumpets and the woodwinds yet. He put it right here to be a little transition between these vocal sections. Mm-hmm. And then this next vocal section is not going to be the same thing as before. It's not going to go right into a fugue thing. It's going to do something different. And it's something I really love. He's got this like sort of more sustained sections with these with these brass lines happening during this section. And the voices kind of just keep doing little fragments of what they were doing before. It's not a fugue anymore. It's it's just kind of, it's a little bit more pulled apart than it was before. I love these little bum bum things. Just these little answers by the trumpets. These little bum bum. Do you think that I could somehow work that out to be my doorbell? Yeah. I mean, just take a recording of this. And... <laughs> bum bum. Hello. But even though I love that, that is not my moment yet. <laughs> but we're so close because now we're only a few measures from the end. My moment falls about four measures till the end. You heard it at the beginning of the episode. It was like we let the ending play at the beginning because it's just so satisfying. But We'll get, we're going to get there in a second. Let's hear this section right here. And then once we get to my moment, I will go, here it is. <laughs> okay, there it was. <laughs> now let's listen to the ending. Okay, so that, just like a lot of these, is a very satisfying ending. And it's because it lands on that, like we talked about that perfect cadence. It lands so, so nicely, like we talked about last episode, with a perfect, authentic cadence. And So why is it that I picked that little moment, which I just called out to be my favorite, that was a few measures from the end? Well, let's hear it one more time and get into it a little bit. Okay, there it is. Now listen for this top note, the soprano line, which I really love here. Here's how it sounds. And 
That is a cute little line, which is not part of our fugal melody, but it's something I really love. And I like the way it interacts with the alto. Now listen to the alto. What, what are the alto doing here? Hey, that sounds familiar. That's our counter subject, right? Yep. So now let's back up a little bit. The alto comes in really, really sneakily with this fugue subject, a couple bars before this. Then it naturally flows into the counter subject, and, it, and the piece ends when the alto finishes the counter subject. This is not a full fugue. It's just that Bach constructed these last few measures out of the alto doing the melody and then the counter subject. And everything else is just built on that. And then how satisfying is that ending, especially how the first soprano goes like this. The last four notes are taken from the subject, but uh, an octave higher and transferred from the second soprano who had the subject. Right, Alex? Oh, the end of the subject line, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's Second a great soprano's point. got the subject at the last three bars. Yep, they're doing it while the alto's doing the counter subject. Mm -hmm. Yes, good point. I didn't even catch that. But then on the word voluntatis, the melody jumps to the soprano one from the soprano two. You know who else is doing it besides the soprano? Second soprano's is the trumpet, really high, and all the high instruments like the high flute and oboe, which is cool. It's like he's got this thing like this. And that is the second soprano line, but he's got the trumpets doing it higher and flutes and oboes. Yeah, those are in octaves. And you don't hear octaves up there all the time in Baroque music. It's used a lot more frequently after the Baroque era as a matter of like melodic texture and color. Yeah, octaves in instrument parts are very rare like we've talked about in the past especially in our pentecost cantata episode octaves between a voice and an instrument are, le are less rare in a big texture like this but they still are kind of rare and it makes you almost lose the second soprano part you can't hear it as well but it is reinforcing yeah i also really love the tenor line at the very end the tenors get to do a nice little feature here kind of high in the tenor range but it's like a it's a part it's like kind of the money part of the tenor range the tenors love to sing in you know? and now here is that ending of the et intera pax If this introduction to a musical moment has inspired you to hear the rest of the Mass in B minor, please see the link in the episode description. Do you want to hear our new episodes as we release them? Find us on your podcast app and hit subscribe. I think I've said this before, but the Netherlands Bach Society video of the Mass in B minor is one of the most high quality things you can find on the internet. And I know that sounds like a big overstatement, but it's really not. It's, it's such a good performance of this huge, beloved work. And I just, like Christian was saying, if you want to hear more, just jump into it. You don't have to do it all in order. I would just I would say, listen to the Gloria and Etintera Pax now that you've heard the episodes. Just jump right to that. It'll be really great to do that. And then keep listening, because there's some great stuff right after, too. Yeah. So, Christian, what are we going to look at next week? We're going to look at a very short and emotional organ piece 
Ich ruf zu dir. BWB 639. Okay. Until next time, enjoy those moments. Thank you.